Let there be light, light, light. How you guys doing today? My name is Pete Cabrera Jr. with the Royal Family International University and School of Identity and Lifestyle. Well, today's going to be an amazing, amazing episode. We're going to be talking about one of the most difficult subjects that, that we can talk about in ministry or in when it comes to the kingdom of God. And we're going to be talking about free will. Like what is free will were we born with free will was free will given to us and that's what we're going to talk about today why is it so vital that we understand what free will is and whether we have free will and we're going to find that out today So we're going to go ahead and start off today with a, with a quick scripture. We're going to start off with Genesis chapter 2, 15. And I'm going to read this. This is going to be in the King James Version. And uh, I'm just going to go ahead and read it. And we're going to pick up from there, okay? And the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. Okay, so nine times out of ten, when I talk to believers or Christians or pastors or leaders, and we have this conversation about free will, one of the first questions that I usually ask, even here at the school of the school of identity and lifestyle, even at the school, I ask the students, I say, okay, when God spoke to Adam in the garden, did God give Adam a choice whether he could eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Did he give him a choice? That's one of the questions that I love to ask is, did God give Adam a choice whether he could eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Now, here's where it gets exciting because we have this idea that when God created Adam and Eve, that they had a choice to do whatever they wanted to do, that they could just choose things. Now, this is what's very interesting, because when you read Genesis chapter 2, 16, you will read there in the text, he's very specific. He says, and the Lord God commanded the man, saying, so this to me, ladies and gentlemen, sounds like God was giving Adam a command. Now, now let's, let's hear what this command is. And the Lord God commanded, commanded the man, saying, this is a command of every tree of the garden you may freely eat but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it for in the day that you you surely die so here we have in genesis 2 16 the lord god commanded the man and in 17 he goes on to say the tree of the knowledge you can't eat so he's commanding the man not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil so folks He's not giving Adam a choice. He's giving him a command. Now, here's where you can run into issues. I am not saying that Adam didn't have a choice. That's not what I'm asking. I am not asking you, did Adam have a choice to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? That is not my question. My question is, did God give him a choice? And the answer is no. God did not give Adam a choice. He gave him a command. If he gave him anything, it was a command. Now, here's where you're going to run into issues. Then you're going to say, well, where does free will come in? And this is where the conversation is going to get really, really interesting. Because when it comes to free will, we have to address what the will of God is. And what is the other will that's actually countering the will of God? And we go to find out that there are two wills that we struggle with. One is the will that causes you not to do the things that God has called you to do. And the other will is the, the one that causes you to do the things that God commands you to do. So this was very interesting because now you're asking, okay, it sounds more like a choice to me. But let me ask you something. And this is where it gets pretty exciting. 
Because we know as Christians, before we gave our lives to Jesus, the Bible tells it confirms that we were all, all slaves to sin. That we were all held captive by sin. This is why Jesus paid the ransom to set us free. So there is no Christian that will not agree that we were all purchased with a price. To confirm this truth, we'll go to 1 Corinthians 6.19, where Paul says, this is in the King James Version, What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own? This is 1 Corinthians 6.20, is the next one that says, For you were bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your bodies and in your spirit, which are of God. So we know that we were bought with a price. We were all purchased with a price. And if you want to hear another scripture, we got Ephesians chapter 2, 3. It says, among whom also we all had our conversations in time past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. So this proves that we were purchased with a price. We lived in the flesh. The things, the issues that we run into as Christians is that we don't understand that we've been liberated from these things we've been set free from these things colossians 1 13 it goes on to say who has delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of his dear son so when we are in the flesh and this is something that a lot of us do not wrap our minds around the flesh has a will the flesh has a will when you live in the flesh you are walking out the will of the flesh which is very interesting so the problem that we run into Christians is that, you know, you'll hear people say like, you know, God gave us free will. So my question is, what does free will mean? And what we do is we confuse free will with freedom of choice. And this is not the same thing because you can make choices in the will of God and still be in the will of God. It doesn't mean you're walking out the will of the flesh. It just means you're making choices as you're in the spirit. Now, if you start walking out the lust of the flesh and you're in the spirit, this is where we start walking out carnality. And this is a big no, no. Okay, so you can be in the spirit and make choices to allow the flesh to animate and you can allow the mind to start thinking instead of taking them captive. And so the issue here is that you are in the will of God and our job our calling as a christian is to walk out the will of god and the issues that we run into is that while we're in the will of god we begin to walk out the desires and the will of the flesh and this is where we run into issues because we don't recognize the difference between the will of the flesh and the will of the spirit in the same way you could be in the flesh and make choices to line up with the will of god and still not be in the will of god Now you're asking yourself, this sounds a little confusing, right? Like, what do you mean by that? I'm going to give you a perfect example of what I'm talking about. Let's say that you are not born again. Let's just say that you are not a Christian. Let's just, um, let's just entertain the thought that maybe you're a Buddhist. Maybe you're some other type of religious fanatic that has nothing to do with Christianity. Uh, Let's just say you're a pagan, right? And you're just, you're just deciding to go out there and start studying all these gods. Maybe you're a Hindu and you say, Hey, um well i hear about this jesus and so you get a hold of this bible and you're a hindu and you're serving all these gods and you believe in all these gods but you never really gave your life to jesus you serve all these other gods but you start reading the bible and you start finding out that this jesus was amazing so you don't ever really give your life to jesus but you start walking out the life of christ you start doing what he's doing Uh, saying what he's saying you start modeling your life after him but you never really submitted your entire life to jesus you know most people would say well if that person died he's not really saved because he didn't give his life to jesus well in the same way we could say that hey man this guy is walking out the will of god even though he's in the flesh this means that you can be walking out the will of god and still not be in the will of God. And this is what I'm trying to address tonight. This is what I'm trying to talk about is the fact that you can be in the flesh, not born again and do all these amazing things, these charities and giving money and loving and doing all the things that God says for us to do. And in the scripture that Jesus talks about is he talks about 
you know, I never knew you. And for those who don't know where that's at, that's in Matthew chapter 7, verse 22. And I'll go ahead and read that. He says, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? In thy name, didn't we cast out devils? And in thy name, didn't we do many wonderful works? And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. So this is very interesting. Why would Jesus say, get away from me if they're doing everything that he said? Why, why would he say that? Because in the same way, and now remember, Matthew, uh, when this was written, uh, Jesus hadn't been crucified yet. He hadn't died yet. And we call this the old covenant, not the new covenant. If you don't know much about that, I have another teaching on that, the old and the new covenant. Um, the new covenant is after the death, burial, and resurrection. In John chapter 7, verse 39, it says, But this spoke he of the Spirit, which they that believed on him should not receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. What this means was, because Jesus hadn't died, and he hadn't resurrected, that the Holy Spirit was not living in a believer yet, because he hadn't died and paid for the actual purchase of sin. Now remember, Jesus didn't just pay for sin, he actually paid for you. He purchased you with a price. And when you get purchased with a price, when you get purchased, the Holy Spirit comes and lives in your heart and it cries out, Abba, Father. This is the born again experience that, that we talk about as Christians. Now, remember, when Jesus is talking, get away from me, I never knew you. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 23, uh, these are people that are, haven't become one with Christ. They haven't become one with him. Now, whether they were doing the things, doing the works, they were doing the will of God. They were functioning in miracles and, and doing all these things. And Jesus saying, on that day, I'm going to say, I never knew you, which means we never became one. And this is what all this is about. So you can walk out everything that Christ calls you to do. You can be an amazing husband. You can be a good person. You can do all these things and still be living in the flesh. And what we call that is basically you're not born again, which means you are still a carnal person who hasn't received Christ, who hasn't become a new creation. Now, everyone who has not been born again is living in the flesh, is not born again, who hasn't been redeemed by the spirit of God, which means we are not sons of God. By the Spirit until we give our lives to Jesus. So everyone who has not given their life to Jesus is still a slave to the flesh. Is still in the flesh. They're not in the Spirit yet. This is why the Scriptures tell us that we should walk in the Spirit, not in the flesh. That's in Galatians 5.16. 5.16 says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. So this lust comes from the flesh because lust is the will of the flesh lust is one of the wills of the flesh it causes you to lust and this is what flesh does and this is one of the things that we run into when we're out there laying hands on the sick we're trying to find out if we're actually walking out the will of god and one of the verses that i like to talk about is in galatians 5 19 through 16 it says now the works of the flesh are manifest i like to use that word works and you can actually use that word works as the will. Now, the will of the flesh are manifest. Now, the wills of the flesh or the will of the flesh. But it says works. Now, the works of the flesh are manifest. Which are these? Adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lasciviousness, adultery, witchcraft, hatred, variant simulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envy, murder drunkenness reviling and such like which i tell you in times past as i've told you that which to do these things should not inherit the kingdom of god but the fruit of the spirit the will of the spirit right and the fruit so we got the works and we have the fruit so we could say but the fruit we say the will but the will of the spirit is love joy peace long-suffering gentleness goodness and faith meekness temperance against such there is no law and they that are in christ have crucified the flesh with the affections of lust once again who have crucified the will of the flesh if we live in the spirit let us also walk in the spirit so what does it mean to walk in the spirit once again you can be in the will of god and to walk in the spirit is basically to recognize and understand that you were one with christ and that you are in the will of god and now you're walking out the will of god not the will of the flesh the will of the flesh are all the things that I just talked about in Galatians 5.19. We call them works. Now, remember, Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. 
And that's a whole other conversation, ladies and gentlemen. We're talking about the works of the devil because we know that the works of the devil are the same as the works of the flesh. We just read that. The works of the flesh are manifest. So what's manifesting in Galatians 5.19? The works of the flesh. So here's the question. What is causing the works of the flesh to manifest here in Galatians? Now, remember, these are Christians who have the Holy Spirit living on the inside of them. Once again, they are one, they become one in Christ. So they're in the will of God. So the key here is to walk out the will of God, which is the will of the spirit, not the will of the flesh. I am not saying that there's no such thing as will. Okay. There is a will. There's the will of the spirit and the will of the flesh. I do not believe God gave us free will. I don't believe that. I believe that when man fell, Man believed that he had free will. And really in that statement alone suggests that we believe that we can choose whether we should be in the will of the flesh or in the will of the spirit. And the Bible calls that a double minded man. And that's in James 1, 7 through 9. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double minded man is unstable in all his ways. So we know that a double minded man won't receive anything that he asked for. And Jesus also goes on to confirm that a kingdom divided cannot stand. And that's in Mark 3, 24. For those who are wondering, it says, and it, and if any kingdom be divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. So here's what's very interesting. I don't believe that God gave man free will. I believe that God gave man a choice. But let's not forget that a command was given and why was the command given because the command is the will of god so when you're asking did god give man free will he didn't give man free will he gave man a command and the very thing that we're fighting against is the flesh the very thing that we're fighting against is sin the very thing that we're fighting against is not something that god gave us that is something that happened at the fall Okay, now, I know we're going a little bit little bit deep, and you know what? We have to. This is something that we have to wrap our mind around. Now, in theory, through Scripture, right, we cannot say that God, that God gave us 10 suggestions, which means if he gave us free will, why they call commands? Because everything that God says in his kingdom is a command. Because everything based on God is given on a word. So let's talk about who God is, right? We have to talk about that. In Psalms uh, 138, 2, he says, I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above thy name, which means that when he says something, when he gives his word, because let's this, this talk about this is the word, okay? So the word does not have free will. It's settled forever. The word cannot be moved. It cannot be shifted. And that is the will of God. So I'm trying to find out why people say we have a free will. When in reality, we're not struggling with the will of God. We're struggling with What will we're in? Are we in the will of the flesh? Are we will in the will of the spirit? And this is not a will issue. This is a lack of understanding whether you're in the flesh or whether you're in the spirit. This is what all this is about. Now, remember, the tree of knowledge was called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It wasn't called the tree of will. It was called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So once again, I am not saying that there is no will, okay? I am not saying that. I understand that God's will be done, okay? So there's a will, and I believe that there's an enemy out there who also has a will, okay? So we have the God of this world, and then we have the God that we serve. So we have to agree that both of them have a will. So now we have to confirm What do we believe that free will is? And free will basically is that God gives us the choice to choose what will we're in. 
But now let me ask you this. Once you're born again and you're in the spirit, you are now one with Christ. So why would you ever choose not to be in the will of God if by the spirit you're already placed in the will of God, who is Christ? So now to say that I have free will means I don't understand what it is to have a king because when you bow the knee to Christ, you no longer have a free will. You've submitted your will and your life to Christ. So for me to say that I took the knee and gave my life to Jesus, but now I can choose, I've already made the choice and the choice was to surrender my life and my will. We know this because Jesus also said, not my will be done, but your will be done. And what is that not my will be done? And God doesn't call that free will when you think you have a choice to do outside of what God has called you to do. God doesn't call that free will. God calls that disobedience. So we must confirm that when Jesus came, Jesus was the will of God. Jesus did not walk around talking about, oh, I have free will. God gave me free will. That is not what he was saying. He was saying "Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So heaven has a will. God has a will. The spirit has a will. Now, before you gave your life to Jesus, we could have called it free will. We could have called it whatever we wanted to call it because we weren't one with Christ. So I call it freedom of choice. You can choose to give your life to Jesus. So we've always had the choice. But now that we're in Christ, what is it that's actually choosing to follow Christ? And what this is, is this is the renewing of the mind. Romans chapter 12, uh, verse 2. Do not conform to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So what you're doing is you're teaching yourself through the spirit to submit to what's already on the inside of you, which is the will of God. So you do not have free will. You have freedom of choice and you can choose to submit or you can choose not to. Now, once again, we don't call that. Free will. There's no one that's going to stand before God and say, well, you know what, God, you gave me the free will to choose. So I, you know, I decided we can't do that because in the kingdom of God, we were given commands and a king gives commands, not suggestions. So I am not saying that there isn't a will. Okay, so don't hear what I'm not saying. There is a will out there. There's you're either in the will of the spirit or you're in the will of the flesh. And that's it. And the struggle that we have is we don't know what will we're in because we don't understand what it is. So I can't say to you that, oh, you know, God gave me free will so I can choose. If that was the case, he wouldn't have gave us commandments. So what is this thing that's actually choosing? And this is the part that needs to be renewed, which a lot of Christians do not understand. Is there's a part of you that does not want to submit to God and it has nothing to do with you. It is the flesh. It is the carnal mind. It is everything of this world that you've been trained and brought up in that you are trying to take to the throne of God to have it submit fully to who God is. Now, if that kind of messes with you a little bit, I understand. I, I, you know, I have a teaching on this that actually breaks it down. Uh, but I'm going to give you an example of what I'm talking about and why it is that I'm hitting on this. OK, so let's just say, OK, I, let's let's do this. Um, let me ask you this because we're going to be talking about will and I know all this is probably getting I mean you probably never heard it in this way and this is why I do the podcast this is why I talk about things because I like to go to I like to go to the root of things okay so let's talk about this okay do angels have free will can they choose to do whatever they want can they choose now remember if you have free will and you choose to do opposite of what God did It shouldn't be a bad thing because you've been given freedom of choice, right? You can choose, right? So if it's will, then you can choose what will you're in. Okay. So let's just, let's think about that. So as an angel, does an angel have free will? Can it do whatever he wants? Okay. So now let's talk about the the demons and the devils. Okay. So devils and demons, do they have free will? Can they do whatever they want? Um, in scripture, Jesus tells them what to do and they have to do it. So it's not like 
Jesus went up to a demon or a devil or evil spirit and he told him something. And then all of a sudden, this evil spirit or demon said, well, you know what? I'm, I'm going to choose not to listen to you right now because, you know, I have freedom of choice. So I can choose whether I should submit to you or not. OK, so now let's let's talk about creation. Does creation have free will? Can creation do whatever it wants? Can it? OK, so now. Can Jesus do whatever he wants can holy spirit do whatever he wants does can god do whatever he wants now hear me out when i say he can do whatever he wants we have to understand that god is a god of order and he honors his own word god will honor his own word even if you won't this is what i love about god he will honor what he said we talked about this earlier about him raising his word above his name which means that he will honor what he said So we know that God will not lie. Why? If he has free will, he can lie, right? No, it's because there are some things that he will not break because he is God. Okay. So in the same way, we have to ask ourselves, when God creates something, does he give this creation free will? Can it do whatever it was created to do outside of what it was created to do? And this is where the struggle starts right here because when man was created he was created in the will of god in the garden and the serpent caused man to fall outside of the will of god because he made a wrong choice now to make this a little more exciting let's just let's have some fun with this okay let's have some fun with this there's this scripture Okay, and I'm going to read it to you. And I want you to really, really chew on what I'm about to say. Okay, because this is very powerful. If you could just wrap your mind around this. Okay, I just need you to really just buckle down and wrap your mind around this. Because remember, we as children of God, we're out there proclaiming the kingdom of God, which means that we only say what the father says and does what the father does. Okay, we're not out there talking about, oh, you know, we have free will. No, we are ambassadors of Christ. We cannot speak for ourselves anymore. We speak for a king now. This is what all this is about. All of this hinges on this right here, what I'm going to be talking about. Okay, so I'm going to go to Luke chapter 7, verse 6. And once again, King James. Then Jesus went with them. And when he was now not far from the house the centurion sent friends to him saying unto him lord trouble not thyself for i am not worthy that thou should enter under my roof therefore neither though i myself worthy to come unto thee but say in a word and my servant shall be healed this is luke 7 8 for i also am a man set under authority having under me soldiers and i say unto one go And he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him, and turned him about, and said unto the people that followed him, saying unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. The reason this is so important is because this man understands authority, okay? He's a man under authority. So let me ask you something. As a born-again believer, under the authority, and as a warrior for Christ, do you understand authority? Do you understand it? Okay, so in Acts 3, 6, hear me out. This is where it gets exciting. Then Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Now remember, this is the story of the guy who's sitting outside of the temple begging. And he's asking for gold and silver. He's begging for money. And Peter says, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. So why am I using these two scriptures back to back? Because you have to understand that they are not functioning in free will. They are functioning in the power of Christ. And the power of Christ 
moves. There is no choice in the matter. What I mean by that is when you lay hands on the sick and you believe that you function in free will, you can only give what it is you believe you have. And if you function under free will, then you can only give free will, which means that sickness and disease, like the the centurion said, I'm under authority, just like you. Which means that you are now the one that's above me. So which means sickness and disease is under you because you carry the Christ. And everything has to bow under Christ. But you are not giving the will of Christ. You now believe and carry that you have free will. Which means you can make decisions based on whatever you decide. And if that's the case, that means that sickness and disease also has a choice. Because you don't understand the authority and the power that you carry. So we do not function under free will we function under the power and authority of christ so christ does not give us free will he gives us his will and it's his will and his power and his reign that drives out sickness disease demons and devils everything that comes against the kingdom of god has to be subject to his will and his power but it's kind of hard to function in that when you're functioning under free will so you're asking yourself okay Peter I just heard everything you said and I'm trying to wrap my mind around it are you trying to say that we don't have free will what I'm saying is you are now in the will of God when you gave your life to Jesus you submitted your will if you believe you have free will you don't understand what it means when the Bible says Jesus is Lord he's Lord of your life Which means that now your whole life is based on who Christ says he is for you. And that's the gospel. That is what you're walking out. You're denying yourself. And the old self was walking around the will of the flesh. So your entire walk is submitting your flesh. Now remember, the flesh has a will. The spirit has a will. What's very interesting is before you gave your life to Jesus, you were one with the flesh. And you were subject to the will of the flesh. This is why you must be born again. When you give your life to Jesus, you are now one with the spirit. So now you're either a slave to the flesh or a slave to the spirit. The Bible talks about that. You are now a slave to righteousness. Slaves do not have free will. Now you can choose what you listen to, but you will be made subject to whatever will you're under. This is what's so powerful about walking out the kingdom of God. When you recognize that you are functioning in the power of Christ, when you recognize that you are under the will of God, when you submit fully, when you submit fully, when you no longer say, I have free will, but you say, my will has been made subject to God. I give myself fully over to God. And you begin to walk that out. That starts flooding in every area of your life. And this is one of the things that we do not recognize when we're out there laying hands on the sick. You have to walk out the will of God. Everything is given on a command. In the same way, when you carry the Christ and you lay hands on the sick, you're not asking sickness if it wants to go. You're commanding it to go because it is under authority and you're the one that carries that authority. Now, how can you give that command if you haven't submitted yourself to that power and you haven't submitted yourself to that authority in the same way you have to submit yourself to that power and authority and that will in order to function in it you know one of the things i talk about is that you know god's will is that no man should perish so why do they and the reason that is is because every man who perishes is not born again which means that they are in the will of the flesh to confirm this, uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 9 says, But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if so be that the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Here it is. You're either in the flesh or in the spirit, and both of them have a will. So then it's all about where do you live? Now, when you say, where do I live? You're thinking mentally, physically, emotionally. No, no, no. The soul. The real you, the soul, is the soul in the spirit or in the flesh? 
And this is the part of you that the Holy Spirit trains, the soul. So the question is, once the soul is in the spirit, does the soul have free will? It does not. It's in the will of God. So what is it that man is struggling with? He's struggling with the flesh and the flesh is constantly telling him. The flesh is telling the mind. The mind is telling you. This is very interesting because you are not the mind. You are the soul. The Holy Spirit is not training the mind, is not training the flesh. The Holy Spirit is training you, the soul. And the carnal mind that's an enmity against God is trying to convince the soul that the reality is in the flesh. When the Bible tells us that we have the mind of Christ, which is the mind of the spirit, telling us that, no, we're in the spirit. And so the struggle is not free will. The struggle is, are you believing what the Holy Spirit is teaching you that you are in the spirit and in the will of God? And yet you have the flesh and the carnal mind and all the things of the world is trying to confirm to you the lie that you are still in the flesh. You are still the old man. You are still carnal. You are still these things. And this is where the battle's at, ladies and gentlemen, right here. When you understand this, you can fight back. You can actually start walking out what you were created to be in Christ because in the spirit you're already that you're already that in the spirit and so this is what you're learning so guys I hope you enjoyed this little time that we had together and uh, you know I'm talking about the will of God I'm talking about free will I'm talking about the carnal mind I'm talking about all these things because really these are things that we do not talk about because these subjects are so deep and sometimes you know we can't get into these discussions because we don't know how to hit them and you know you know I've given my life to studying the word i've given my life to be a student of the word and so that's what i do i give my life to the altar um i pray i fast i dig i search because my job is to feed the sheep and so i don't have a nine to five to, per se that i'd go out there and go to work and do all these things and then on my free time i study i've given my life to study i've given my life to searching the scriptures i've given my life to this because the lord said feed my sheep and that's what I've been doing. Now, if you have a job and all that, that's admirable. There's nothing wrong with that. Don't misunderstand me. But because of what I've done through the school and because of your faithfulness and because of everything that's been given to me through Christ, I am able to do this for you. And this is the reason why I started the podcast, because I want to go a little bit deeper. I want to touch on subjects that most people won't touch. And I'm doing this because I know that there are a group of people out there. There's a remnant out there that want to lay hands on the sick, that want to do the things that God has called them to do. And the only way they're going to learn is if we tap into these deeper things. You know, the Bible says that the deep cries out to deep. And, you know, I've had men of God tell me, oh, Pete, you're going too deep. You got to be careful with that. And I'm like, wait a minute. If the Holy Spirit searches out the deep things of God, why is he doing that? That's because he wants to teach me the deep things of God. And the only way we're going to do that is if we actually go into the text, go into prayer and start digging what it is that God has for us. Now, remember, God's mysteries are there. They're there. And if we don't search and we don't look and we don't find, how are we going to find them? And it's all there, ladies and gentlemen. It's right there in your Bible. You can look, you can you can search Uh, The Bible says to knock and ask and look. And so there are a lot of us that don't want to do the work. I love doing the work. And this is why I put the podcast out there. Now, remember, God hides truth. Everything in scripture is hidden. A treasure is hidden. Everything's hidden. Why is that? Because he wants you to look. He wants you to dig. He wants you to find. Because those who are serious will search out the truth. They will look for it. Right. And that's what this is about. So, guys, I hope you enjoyed Uh, this time Uh, if you would like to give towards uh, what it is I'm doing you can go to www.royalfamilyinternational.com and you can click on the donation button so guys I really enjoy this time thank you very much guys and I hope you enjoyed this podcast okay now once again I am not saying there isn't a will out there what I'm asking is what will are you in so until next time Jesus is real star I'm just this hype man God bless. Let there be light.